Welcome to today's webinar, The State of Procurement Technology in 2018, The Future is Now. Um, tell you a little bit of uh, housekeeping uh, information before we get into the future, which is now. Uh, so we're on the WebEx platform, so uh, the, the options available through the WebEx is to use the chat box at any point in the the webinar presentation today to, to log in your any questions that you may have or any technical problems that, that we'll dispatch immediately. Um, one of the questions that often comes up in our webinar presentations is how do I get the slide deck? For hours you'll receive a, a thank you email uh, after today's webinar that will include the slide deck, uh, which actually uh, excerpted highlights from the brand new article and partners report on the state of procurement technology 2018. So the, the email that you receive will actually also include links for you to download a full copy of the report if you'd like to have it, as well as uh, continuing education credit that's available for your attendance in today's webinar. So my name is Richard Wabi, your host for today. I'm Vice President of Corporate Development at Zykus, uh, also your sponsor for this. And I'd like to introduce my co-presenters today. First, Andrew Bartolini, Founder and Chief Research Officer at Arden Partners. He's a globally recognized expert in sourcing procurement and supply management. He's been a cheerleader for procurement for nearly 20 years, a tireless advocate evangelist for the procurement profession, focused his research and efforts on helping enterprises to develop and execute strategies to achieve best-in-class performance in their procurement and finance departments. Welcome, Andrew. Good. Hello, everybody. And I'd like to also introduce Matthew York, research analyst at Arden Partners. Uh, Matt brings more than a decade of business research expertise and he's fascinated by emerging technologies like big data analytics, blockchain ledgers, the Internet of Things, and how these emerging and innovative technologies can enrich business operations. So in that regard, Matt is Arden's official technology futurist. When you're younger in the tooth like me, you become an historian as opposed to a futurist. <laughs> but Matt's our futurist, and he's been named a pro to know by and demand chain executive Magazine. Welcome, Matt. Good to be here. Oh, uh, let me just give you a little bit of context about Zykus, and I'll have Andrew introduce Art and Partners as well, and then we'll delve right into the session today. It's apropos that we're talking about the state of procurement technology, yet that's all we do at Zykus. We're a technology provider of a comprehensive suite source to pay tool, so that encompasses Everything from spend analytics through e-sourcing, contract and supplier management, the upstream or strategic aspects of procurement, as well as the downstream operational procurement encompassed in procure pay and tying that all together, uh, making sure that procurement gets credit for savings that are delivered, a, a financial savings management capability as well. And Zykus has been consistently recognized uh, one of the very few uh, leaders uh, in Partners Magic Quadrant, for example, for, for suite providers. So that's about Zykus. Uh, Andrew, let me ask you to tell us a little bit about Arden Partners and CPO Rising. Great. Thanks, uh, Richard, for that great intro. And um, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so, so Arden Partners, I'll actually have a slam in a, in a few, but uh, one of the, the things that we do is we publish a network of sites, and one of those is CPO Rising which is a site that really tackles the, the challenges and, and concepts and strategies that uh, help procurement organizations uh, drive success across their operations and uh, impact their results. If you enjoy uh, today's presentation, I invite you to uh, visit the site, cporising.com. Now, we like the title and concept of CPO Rising because procurement has been on the rise over the past uh, uh, 20 years that I've been working in this industry. Um, CPO Rising is also the name of, of our annual event that brings uh, approximately 150 CPOs and other goal leaders uh, 
to Boston for um, a two-day executive symposium. Um, you know, it's a, uh, an event that, um, you know, we we spend a large amount of time focused on and, and, and executing, but, you know, it really is um, an opportunity for uh, procurement leaders to come together and exchange best practices and network with like-minded peers. And, you know, for those of you that are uh, interested, please uh, investigate the site there, events.cprising.com, and uh, definitely uh, consider saving the date, uh, this number. Um, now, Artners right? so we're a Boston-based research and advisory firm that focuses on defining and advancing the supply management and financial operations strategies, processes, technologies that drive business value and accelerate organizational transformation within the enterprise, right? So we focus only on supply management, and, and we publish research that, that helps organizations uh, understand industry best practices and how to improve their performance. And then we publish research like the uh, today's presentation um, upon the is a report based uh, procurement technology. Um, you know, this type of research helps um, procurement and, and AP organizations gain insights into the technology landscape and understand uh, strategies to identify the best fit solutions for their budgets and requirements. So uh, our, our agenda today is, um, again, based upon a report that Matt York and I recently published, and, and, and Zykus is going to make that report available to you. And, and, and the, the structure of today's presentation generally follows the, the structure of that, that report, uh, but, but, but we also have a great, great fortune in doing is uh, we've got Richard, uh, who's going to come in and layer in three great case studies that really looks at um, – in organizations in different levels of maturity, right? And so I, I do a lot of presentations. We produce um, an enormous amount of research. And, and one of the challenges that that we often face, right, is 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 finding the the right the right level of engagement, or where to start the conversation, uh, because procurement organizations are you know can you know great about procurement extraordinary commonality um, in in processes and in best practices and in the technologies that can really drive value across operations. But organizations are obviously at different levels of maturity for a variety of reasons. And, and Richard's coming in with, with three great stories there to, to really enhance the, the overall presentation. And, and, you know, I think you're going to have some great takeaways. Now, the state of procurement technology um, and the state of procurement in, in 2018, right, it continues to be a profession that is on the rise. But, but but hasn't quite um, reached its destination, right? The the procurement marketplace, when we think about technology over the last decade, really has been a tale of two cities, right? The the, the group that we call the best in class, the top performers. So we we identify those in, in all of our research studies as the the top twenty percent of performers. Uh, this best in class, these best in class procurement departments, you know drive significant value and, and, and have been generally transformative to their overall businesses, right? These leaders have become um, competitive advantages for their businesses. Um, but, you know, more common, right, so the other 80% is the group that, that still struggle to execute efficiently and with pre precision and, and, you know, oftentimes fail to reach their potential. Uh, now, now, his presentation, I think, is relevant for both groups and, 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 and really, you know, procurement organizations of, 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 of all levels of maturity is that when we look at the list of differentiators between the top performers and those that are struggling, uh, the laggers, and, and maybe those that are in the middle, um, you know, the ability to use and drive techno a value from technology investments sits at the top of those differentiators. And, and you know, one of the, the really exciting things about the procurement technology market today is that we really have entered uh, an age of innovation. And, you know, it, it, we think it's important for all organizations, whether you are, um, you know, an apprentice or our master using the uh, uh, you know the the nomenclature of the studies that Richard's going to use, you know we think there's a new set of uh, technologies that are starting to emerge and make an impact uh, for organizations. And so, um, hope by sitting in today's presentation, you're going to have a little bit more context to understand what's happening in the market. Um, let's look at what's happening in in, in the CEO's realm and, and within the realm of procurement. And um, you know 
the research that we're showing here is based on a survey that we conducted last year, uh, drawn from more than 300 uh, CPOs and, and, and global procurement executives. Um, you know, what we're sh what I'm showing you here is, well, you know, what are the CPOs' top priorities looking at over the next couple of years? And, um, you know, this is the so this is a research study that I've conducted annually for the past 12 years, and this is the first time that savings hasn't been the top. Uh, mid-term priority, um, and you know that may be attributed to where we are in the business cycle. Um, but I think that, that 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 more of that is that you know, is, or, you know, understanding that that savings is not uh, the end all and the be all of of procurement success, and that more organizations are are also understanding that. And and so as a result, uh, CPOs over the next couple of years are really focusing in on the areas that need to be bolstered. Um, you know, their processes, their, uh, the level of skills that they have. And, and when we, we start to look at why is those areas, we, we look at the top challenges facing procurement departments. We head into 2018. Um, and, and so for many, many years, um, and, and even anecdotally, right, I, I, I spend a lot of time working with CPOs. And, and interviewing them and, um, you know, briefing with them to understand what's happening in the marketplace. Um, you know, by and large, those conversations inevitably hit upon uh, the staff and the talent capabilities within their departments, and, and that has been a longstanding challenge, um, as we see here, for 44 percent of organizations. So you know, maybe a little bit less than half, but um, the challenges that organizations face on the on the talent side are both the talent standpoint, right? So procurement's purview continues to expand and grow, and you know, procurement continues to be asked to do more, whether that's placing more spend under management or tackling other, um, you know, or um, you know, complementary um, tasks and activities. Um, you know they're not given headcount to to match that expanded um, purview. Uh, the other challenge that organizations face is the the level of skills within the, with the existing organization and and how do you upskill them. Uh, now, now budget constraints is 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 also you know something that you know I think is you know one of the re, you know is is you know can be explained by where procurement sits within uh, the average organization today, right? Procurement is not typically at the front of the line when it comes to when it comes to budget time. Um, so, challenges, but you know, sir, what are CPOs doing in response to those challenges? And um, for the first time, again, you know, 12 years, uh, you know, doing this annual study, um, for the first time, you know, ever. You know, we had savings not uh, as, as the top CPO priority. Um, and for the first time uh, ever, we also have uh, improving the use of technology as the top strategy uh, in a given year. Um, and and so, you know, why is this significant? Um, I think that you know, organizations have uh, um, you know, obviously the procurement technologies have been around for a long period of. Time and 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 are you know, part of the explanation of why procurement has really transformed from a a, a back office function to something that is much more strategic, uh, you know, by and large across uh, across the, around the globe. Um, and use of technology, I think that that you know we have seen such a significant amount of innovation uh, in the supply management technology market over the past couple of years that the solutions now are much more usable and much more accessible. And, uh, you know, as CPOs, you know, top performing organizations understand that, you know, they're not going to be able to dramatically increase their headcount anytime soon. The ability to use technology to scale operations, to enhance the talent within the organization, and to, you know, continue to support an expanded um, or growing list of, of responsibilities, um, you know, in, a, in an efficient and effective way, um, you know, technology really does become, you know, a, a, a critical enabler. Um, you know, it helps in, in some of these other strategies as well, whether it's proving capabilities um, uh, or collaboration uh, with, with the budget holders or improving communication across the organization. Um, you know, we think we're on, on, the, on the cusp of the next wave of, of, of technology advancing uh, within, within procurement organizations. Um, and we think that that wave is overdue. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the list of 
primary procurement applications that that support the main operations within a, a, a standard procurement department. And I'm showing you the percentage of enterprises that have adopted each of the solutions. And um, you know, I am you know, no longer surprised by these numbers. Uh, they continue to to tick up slightly year over year. Uh, but but you know, what we see here is that you know, by large. Um, most procurement organizations have not fully automated their source to settle process, right? So, you, you know, outside of e-procurement and e-sourcing, which have been uh, around for the longest period of time and, and, and from a functionality standpoint are the most mature applications in the market, um, you know, even there, um, you know, there is a, a large number of, of procurement departments and enterprises that, that haven't started to utilize these technologies. And we think that that time is overdue. Um, certainly there are entities and, and challenges in, you know, all, all different types of organizations and, you know, the different models and, 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 and Different maturities and different approaches are, uh, or I should say that, that different approaches are required for organizations that are at different points in their, their maturation, the different levels of sophistication that exist in the market. And so I'm going to uh, Richard back into the conversation and let him walk you through a great, st a great case study focused on uh, the apprentice type of organization. So Richard. That's right. And you know, as you mentioned, we're going to sort of use this metaphor that's uh, in place in the skilled trades of, you know, you progress from the apprentice to the tradesman to the master. And first case study will start at, at the logical starting point, the apprentice. So when you're an apprentice, you're at sort of veritable blank slate. Uh, you're there to learn. You need everything. You need it all at once. Um, you know, in terms of the, the the technology adoption market, sort of the backstory that we print here is these are those organizations that, that have largely been on the sidelines. You just showed us the adoption rates of various different types of procurement technologies, you know, ranging from 50 percentile to, you know, down as low as 20 percent. But for this apprentice group, they're, they're really just getting started. It's a clean sheet of paper. And not the exclusive domain of, of what we'll call mid-market or high-growth organizations, but those of organizations in particular uh, have more likely to have been on the sidelines to this, this point. Larger enterprises being amongst the earlier adopters of, of procurement technology, but many at this stage find themselves in the situation where they've outgrown their existing technology infrastructure that may be some some kind of legacy and or ERP type systems, and the challenges that they face is just doing the basics. Um, you know, limited resources, they tend to therefore be consumed by just trying to get order processed and, and invoices paid. So, you know, a disproportionate amount of resource consumed by inefficient and tactical transactional processing. And the symptom, if you will, here is a lack of control. So rampant maverick spend, really limited spend visibility. And key drivers for a lot of organizations at this stage is there's some type of a compelling compliance event. So the organizations, that, again, they, they may be growing very rapidly and either had a recent or pending IPO or in the midst of some type of M&A activity, they're driving a need for you know, more formalized and mature procurement information infrastructure that provide that single version of the truth that they need to satisfy auditors and regulators, for example. So it all comes down to where do I start? I can't go all at once. I've got to prioritize. For, the, for these organizations, it's about getting control first over transactional procurement. Stop the, stopping the leaking, you know, the, those saving opportunities that are leaking away because of, you know, not being able to control maverick spending and establish at a minimum compliance to be able to satisfy, as mentioned, the auditors and regulators, et cetera. So the blueprint for this organization at the apprentice stage is a critical first step is getting control over this operation of, of transactional procurement. So starting with getting suppliers 
was onboarded. It's a facility for supplier information management. Get the suppliers on board. Um, enable visibility to those approved contracts with, with your preferred suppliers to make sure that you're funneling spending those those preferred agreements. So a contract repository, a credit enabler there, there as well. And of course, the hub of this would, would be a, a procure to pay capability to automate uh, the, the requisitioning, ordering, and, and invoice approval processes. So let me share with you a quick case study of one organization that found themselves in that predicament, uh, took this critical first step in, in automating transactional P2P. It happens to be private insurance company, and there's a lot packed into this one case study. But as I unpack it, to, uh, you know, the starting point was really that uh, there was next to nothing in place. So no single source of truth when the supplier data, compliance routine, so a very high no PO and non-compliance spend and you know, lack of control over the process and done with without approval workflows and creating extensive manual rework in the, the ERP model was being used to try to manage all this. So what did they do? They did deploy uh, procure to pay and supplier information management. Uh, so that's a best of breed capability to really address this this critical shortfall here. And importantly, they really focused on surgical approach to supplier enablement. So again, at, at this stage of the apprenticeship, you keep everything all at once. It really does come down to prioritization and the priority call made in this case here was let's focus on the money rule, which always tends to ring true. Who are the 20% of our suppliers account for 80% of the spend volume? Get them on board at first. And of course, uh, you know, highly usable, state-of-the-art tools available to your suppliers is best practice here as well. And so is a strong endorsement. So communicated to the suppliers that this is going to be mandatory participation. Uh, you hold their hands through webinars and outreach and those kinds of things, but don't uh, overlook the importance of a, a strong endorsement uh, to getting those suppliers on board. And a very dramatic story here of getting those 20% of suppliers, about 500 suppliers, really onboarded, enabling them to receive electronic orders and to, to detach electronic invoices back as well. And the 80-20% rule uh, ran through. So tier suppliers that are commerce savvy are enabled via a standard protocol like CXML. But simply having a portal available for the other 80% uh, that you need a browser to, to access the system really was key to getting that kind of adoption, not just on the, the use side of the buying organization, but on the supplier side as well. At the end, what are the results? It's really about freeing up the resources in permanent and accounts payable to focus on more strategic things other than this transactional process. So by enabling a supplier portal, you reduce the vendor management FTE support by 87%. You take 40% out of the cycle time for getting invoices approved and paid. Uh, maximize early pay discounts. You get visibility and, you know, 100K savings just by eliminating duplicate payments alone. So a lot packed in, as I said there, but really emblematic of, of you know, what it takes to, to get through that apprentice stage by automating you know, procurement so that you can transition to more strategic activities in procurement. So with that, let me turn it back to you, Andrew. That's a great case study. And, and, and just to, to think about that case study for a second, and once more, you know, I think it's valuable for those listening in today for a couple of reasons, right? So, so first, right, so one of the challenges within procurement and sourcing, I use the umbrella term supply management, right, so that includes uh, AP, right? So the source to settle process, you know, one of the challenges that, that, that particular organizations are faced with or AP organizations 
organizations are faced with is that the success of their technology deployment is reliant on a third party. Uh, in this case, the supplier, right? And so lots of other organizations don't have that, right? You look at HR, you look at finance, they can mandate that the employees use the system and they can drive adoption in a in, in a very direct way, right? So with, with P2P, uh, very specifically, right, you need to have uh, a sophisticated or advanced supplier enablement strategy. And so, you know, when you're able to work with an organization that has successfully delivered uh, suppliers onto the platform or have helped enable them, um, you know, that's a big success. And then the other second point that I think is it's important to point out is that when these solutions are deployed, the ROIs that you get are as compelling as any other investment in enterprise technology, full stop. Right. So um, when you're looking to make the business case, and if those of you are having trouble competing for funds within the organization, feel free to reach out with us. We'd be happy to hop on a call and walk you through, um, you know, full case studies and our research that bears out examples like this apprentice private insurer. Now, you know, why does Chairman invest in technology? And, 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 and there are different reasons for it. And, you know, what you saw there, right, so there was streamlining efficiencies, there was increasing savings, becoming more effective, right? They were able to take the staff that was focused on supplier management and get them on more strategic activities. Um, you know, at some level um, along the way, right, you're reducing risk. Maybe it's financial risk in this case as you're able to control more spend with a P2P deployment. Um, it's the point the point would be that there's a variety of reasons why organizations invest in technology and and some of those hit the bottom line and help from an ROI story and some of them are softer benefits as well you know, in this, this uh, slide I guess you know really does show that there is a difference between doing something and doing something well and and, and that continues to be you know, a theme within procurement more broadly, but certainly within procurement technology. What, what I'm showing you here is the, the self-rated grades that CPOs gave their organizations for their level of technical proficiency. And what you see is that, you know, a small handful of organizations, right, 15% are, are operating at the, the um, you know, advanced or very advanced stage, uh, stage. The systems are highly adopted and that most targeted users use the solutions very well. Um, you know, what, what really is much more likely to be is, is, is on the left side of this chart, right, the poor and adequate, rare um, results are muted uh, because, uh, you know, the users are not sophisticated, are, are not adopting the solutions as well. And so, you know, I think it's important to point out that, you know, with any of these technology deployments, right, um, you know, these huge changes, management projects. I think that, um, that that has gotten lost along the way and for a lot of organizations that, you know, they believe that introducing the technology is just a, a slight a slight pivot away in a slight pivot or slight change in how organizations are doing things. And, and, and the reality is it's a dramatic change. And I think that if you go into it with that view and that you get the organization fully vested in understanding, this is a big change, but it's very important because you can get the results like the, the case that Richard just showed, um, that, that that can begin to, to change the the version of results here and get more organizations into the advanced, very advanced, or at least good level. Now, you know, one of the things that is not surprising, right, so we asked organizations to, to rate what are the criteria that are most important investing in procurement technologies and, you know, what we've seen, and it's in part because of the, the results we saw on that last chart where a lot of organizations really are struggling to, to get full value out of their technology investments. Um, some providers, I think, have been, been you, know, you know, very, very adept at, at hearing and seeing this in the marketplace, and, and Zyka certainly is one that for many, many years has, um, you know, highlighted usability as, as one of the key differentiators of its solution. Um, they're doing so because it's important that, you know, things, um, you know, that, that sit there unused aren't driving the value that they that, that they otherwise could. And, and key to getting users to use the solutions is, is making it easy for them. Um, obviously, you need things like, like you have to be able to do the things that you need it to do. So from a features and functionality standpoint, that makes sense. Um, certainly, reporting and, and integration, um, you know, broadly in the marketplace, those capabilities continue to improve and, and are important. Um, you know, the point I, I, the final point I'd make on this chart is that what you don't see on this chart is price. Right, you know, the cost of the investment of the solutions is not a top criteria. Um, you know, there's far more invested in 
uh, deploying a you know a full suite of solutions, a source to settle, a source to pay solutions um, across your organization than the cost of actually licensing or using the subscribing to the software. And you know like that that that's that. You know, organizations are realizing that. Obviously, you know, it's not on the chart, but it is something to to take away as well. Um, you know, this slide here, right? So, so kind of a busy slide, but but what we've done is we've overlaid the best in class organizations organizations as shown by the dark blue, uh, and compared them to the other eighty percent, the group that we would call all others, and then you know we looked at the level of of adoption at the application level uh, for organizations. And, and, and while this is some, somewhat of an IT chart, you know, what we see is that um, you know, the best class have adopted each of different solutions you know, on average 30% more, more frequently than their peers. Um, you know, but, but beyond the adoption, right, and, and getting the solutions in place, they're better used of the technology too, uh, they have stronger ROIs uh, uniformly, uh, and and they their levels of proficiency are are significantly higher as well. So it's not just putting the systems in and you know if you build it they will come. You know they are vested in as of the organization in continuing to use and advance um, you know the value that they're getting out of those deployments. And and so so Richard, case study number two, right? We've moved from apprentice to tradesman. Yeah, at the tradesman uh, stage, we're at that intermediate level of an overall transformation project. So typical of this stage is an organization that is executing pretty well on the basics of procurement, but hasn't yet optimized the entire process. And that's due in large part to the fact that the utilizing islands of automation at this stage, the uh, experiencing you know, are a moderate level, certainly below what they target in terms of user adoption because of a non-integrated, non-intuitive type of an approach. So certainly one of the, the steps at this stage is to, to look more holistically across to pay. How can we take an integrated approach to that? And I think the other characteristic at this stage is, is not just looking at getting our own house in order, our own being, you know, sourcing and procurement, but that how we get that connective tissue that aligns procurement with other key stakeholders. So as you see from the earlier technology adoption uh, slide, Andrew, some of those tools that tend to lag behind in terms of adoption are the type of capabilities that need to be added to move from, you know, the tradesman stage or intermediate level to, to the more advanced or master level. So that means Supply analytics to, to gain insights into spending that enable procurement to more effectively engage budget owners, maybe tap into some of the categories that they haven't been able to address previously, or, or more effective and, and cohesive and coordinated approach to supplier management that brings in other stakeholders across GRC, it's risk and compliance. Uh, when it comes to contract management, as you showed earlier, while many organizations may have deployed a repository to get visibility to at an enterprise level to agreements, macking that authoring capability that's going to not only standardize the process but get legal engaged uh, in, in the entire contracting life cycle. And finally, a, a more effective front end, uh, a portal to the procurement process that allows end users through a request management capability to, to ease more effectively with the procurement function, get procurement involved uh, where they're needed and have visibility to the status of their request. So that's really a, what the Eastman, uh, stage focuses on. I'm going to share with you a case study here. Um, don't need to tell you too much about who Porsche is, obviously an iconic sports car. In fact, this looks like the car driving, Andrew. Um, so Porsche uh, America, Porsche Cars North America, actually operating a shared services type of a procurement center uh, that serves PCNA as well as 11 other North American affiliates. So I want to talk about what were the challenges they face from a shared services procurement standpoint, sort of being at this intermediate 
that level along the transformation journey and challenges that we look across areas of you know request management, sourcing, contract management, fire information and and project management overall. Um, you know, first but they lacked an ability to engage end users because of you know highly the manual and inefficient process. Most of the time, end users are picking up the phone or sending an email to a person saying, I need help to get a supplier on boarded or a contract negotiated or, or a sourcing event committed, um, and not really having any visibility or transparency into the status of those requests, as well as not having a way to effectively triage those requests, because they're not all equal important and procurement needs to a way to prioritize uh, requests that come in to the work queue and make sure they're working on the right thing. So when it came to seeing then low adoption and therefore non compliance to the prescribed process, they have a contract repository but no authoring capabilities. So they really hadn't brought in into the process. And when it came to supply information management, a symptom typical of a number of organizations is that supplier data was in fact fragmented across multiple disparate systems. So you're lacking that single version of truth when it comes to suppliers. And then overall, from a project management standpoint, it's like driving this high performance car with no gauges on the dashboard. So no enterprise level visibility and reporting from a management standpoint and, and, and no effective means for enabling cross functional collaboration at the at the the carrier project team level. So to address those challenges and apply sort of the Porsche principle here, which is how do we translate performance into speed and success, um, employing an integrated suite of tools that, that enabled all of these capabilities was key to improving dramatic the performance of the shared services procurement group. And it starts with that, that port of procurement, that front end for end users. And the principle that they applied first and foremost was by enabling self-service access for end users, maybe procurement doesn't have to get involved at all. If end users can get with the appropriate security and access permissions access to the contracts that they need to see or supplier scorecards that they want to review, maybe they don't need to get procurement involved at all. So that was the, the, the going in principle is a staff self-service for end users, but for the or needs that, that an end user can't resolve on their own, have this request management front end uh, to automate that process. Uh, uh, and make sure that procurement is working on the right things. So sophisticated conditional approval workflow, uh, depending on the nature of the request, make sure that when it lands on procurement's work queue that uh, it's already been pre-approved and they're working on the right things. And oh, by the way, they use this request management facility not just for traditional procurement type requests, source events, contracts, suppliers, but also non-procurement things like envisioning uh, hotels or, or facilities, uh, projects, and those kinds of things. So transferring or, or segueing then into the sourcing process, uh, more intuitive, more standardized, templatized processes to accelerate the, the overall sourcing cycle and drive efficiency, adding authoring in contract management so that you can standardize the process and define Types and subtypes and, and required clauses, and I'll speed along the approval cycle because, after all, in that contract in place is key to time to value. You've negotiated the best total cost agreement. If it takes you an inordinate amount of time to get that contract in place, you're not realizing the value. So, automating the approval workflow for contract approvals and providing a contract summary review for those signatories to be able to just look at the pertinent uh, terms and conditions in a contract to be able to sign off on it. An integrated process to SIM was also key in, in this case. So supplier onboarding that encompasses a conditional logic and workflow to 
for instance, enable IT security reviews when you're onboarding certain types of vendors that meet that meet certain risk profile. Having that one source of truth for all your suppliers, whether those are potential operational or strategic suppliers. And then at the end of the day, having that dashboard visibility with all of your gauges operational to manage the process in a more systematic way from, from a procurement leadership standpoint. So uh, it was about realizing the vision going from zero to 60 very fast. So at this single source of of the truth, uh, deploy easier to use solutions to drive higher adoption, et cetera, and, and in very short order, so less than a year, getting a uh, critical mass of contracts visible, uh, off a number of sourcing events, getting all your suppliers in one place, and across a, a number of savings projects driving a, a significant percentage of incremental savings as well. So this is how you move very quickly uh, into that tradesman stage to to get to the, the next stages of maturity. So let me turn that back to you, Andrew. Great, great, great. So, so Portia, with the, the visibility um, on the dashboard and, and the results that, that cascade out because of it, right, and, and doing it at a, at a you know, at I think fast pace. Um, you know, what I'm showing you here is the level of visibility that procurement organizations have, again, stratifying or comparing the best in class, right, those top performers, right, who, as, as we saw a few slides ago, have adopted technology to greater degree and with greater impact. Um, you know, we haven't really focused on the results, but the best in class save more, they place more spend under management, they have higher levels of compliance. Um, what we see here is, you know, the effect of, uh, you know, you know, of, of, of their greater use of technology and while you know, the best class do not possess universal visibility, the frequency in which they possess it compared to the others is compelling, and, and it ranges as high as nearly three times greater when looking at areas like compliance and supplier performance and risk. And the, this visibility, you know, certainly does translate into results. But but now we're going to pivot and start to look at, um, you know, the future, and, and, and as the report is titled, the future is now. And so I'd like to reintroduce uh, our analyst and our technology futurist, Matt York. So Matt. Andrew, you know, we often say to our and partners that it's an exciting time to work in procurement because of procurement's mission and value proposition, but because technology is changing the game of procurement and supply management as a whole. You know, two decades, procurers and practitioners have been, do, have been on the long and steady march towards transformation and process automation, and, and saw that in, in the charts uh, previously. And there have been some other transformative technology, technological developments over the years. You know, lies the solution suites, the proliferation of mobile devices and mobile applications, and these migrations to the cloud. But now, years later, we are right away of innovation into the future of procurement. Here it's happening now. Now, I'm to discuss a concept here, something that's emerged from the manufacturing industry. Industry, and that's 3.4.0. Know technologies are a level step above what you know is a digital automation technology. They go beyond process automation and linkage to effectively make the world smaller. They connect from point to point. They drive visibility and control into supply chains. They consolidate data and information right in front of us and closer to our sources, whatever they may be. Um, you know, listen to refer to the, to the report for full definitions, but let's quickly look at examples, starting with blockchain, one of my favorites. Um, blockchain ledgers, which are all the rage today, are connecting partners around the world and automatically and irreversibly recording every transaction they make. When deployment and supply chain, blockchain enable us to track and trace goods in transit, to trust in the relationships, shine light into potentially dark and shady practices, and make supply chains more transparent, ethical, and compliant. When linked or integrated with the devices, which I'll get to in a second, the use cases grow considerably. Connected to you know, the so-called Internet of Things or the industrial Internet of Things are, thanks to advances in microprocessors and transmitters, 
collect transmitting data from point to point in an everyday device like appliances, equipment, and chicken containers, and even factories and warehouses to be smart, self-aware, self-dosing, self-serving. Services can tell us a great deal about themselves and users in the world around them and help to form business decisions, the need for service, or inventory replenishment, or greater enforcement or compliance. And make all of this information back to end users or point to point as part of the industrial network. And all of these features are bringing data, inputs, and even locations closer to the end user than ever before. Technologies like Google Glass and Apple's forthcoming smart glasses are seeing a variety of structured and unstructured data right into the lenses of end users, allowing to see a host of pertinent sourcing, procurement, and supplier information in front of them to execute their tasks. They can actually transport themselves to other locations like flyer sites, in proceedings, or you know, commodity points of origin using the feeds that are piped directly onto their lenses with text layers for greater context. So the industry 4.0 technologies are starting to bring end users closer together and closer to their business operations around the world. Now is making the world smaller. Artificial intelligence is making the world smarter. The term intelligence has been used and abused quite a bit lately. And the matter is, it's not any one technology, but rather it's, a, it's an ecosystem of interconnected smart technologies. And it means that when they represent a whole that's greater than some of the parts that audits knowledge workers rather than replaces them. Artificial intelligence is in the advanced data management and analytics engines that is to consume big data for procurement, terabits of data that the human hand couldn't possibly process on their own. Getting algorithms to study user data, that adapt user workflows, that look hidden insights, and that hidden sourcing and procurement opportunities or something that the human eye couldn't see. Codes enable machines to replicate human level cognition. The pure layers of the problem, like a higher quality issue, and independently dig deeper for a solution. Image processing and speech mission software that enable users to seamlessly interface with computers and put them to work for us, not for them. It's in the shots that pop up in the margins of our desktops and it's notifications to us, like the status of a contract review, or that's, or, or that's this if we need help today. And it's Siri and Alexa and Cortana. Ability to answer questions, execute on tasks, and do seamlessly. In robotic process automation, you know, which is to outsource smaller tasks to a bot that are readable, scalable, and important, but as knowledge workers, just aren't worth our time. You know, AI innovations are personal and now are professionalized easier and exciting and allow us to take on more strategic, value added work. It is going to get to the next level of performance. Um, you know, people like to say that uh, the AI is going to replace us at some point or, you know, put us out of jobs, but I just don't see it happening. I see that them being part of our lives and part of our, our, our workflows uh, for some time and really helping us to, to, to achieve our, our highest potential as knowledge workers. Now, how some innovative and progressive procurement teams are applying some of these technologies to, to spend analysis. You know, some providers have integrated machine learning and learning into data analytics engines to enable their applications to learn and replicate user behaviors to uncover hidden opportunities and optimize spend and the things that I just covered and how companies are doing this. Um, you know, learning algorithms can analyze user behaviors during the air spend analysis process, from extra spend data from sources to cleansing, classifying, analyzing, and presenting it. And the more users interface with an application uh, you know, that's integrated with, with machine learning, the more that user data, I'm sorry, the more that your data in the engine will analyze and the more they can predict different users' next moves. 
and when, excuse me, this is where we really pay attention, future truly intelligent spend analysis solutions may be to not only identify hidden or missed savings opportunities and spend data, but by using that data, they may not be able to predict seasonal lows and trading patterns, commodity surpluses. Uh, excess production capacity or, or other conditions that depress prices and make them advantageous to buy now. And we'll spend analysis tools could be empowered to proactively suggest when to purchase commodities based certain internal or uh, you know external market conditions. In doing so, providers could trace a direct line between automated spend analysis and internet tools and use the former to drive the latter in an autonomous or governed manner. Spend intelligence could directly inform and drive automated purchases beyond seeing as the natural starting point for the, the, the strategic sourcing process. It's getting stuff, and it's being able to, to use data and use and put it to, to use for us rather than just having us manage it and try to make it on our own. Uh, we can get predictive, we can get proactive, we can get automated, um, you know, we, we can put it to use for us. And, and now I'm going to pass it back to Richard, who's got a really interesting case study to share with us. Yeah, you've given us a glimpse to the future, and uh, it's exciting. And as we said at the outset, the future is now. So, you know, many of these technologies are being deployed you know, as we speak at various levels with, with different organizations. And, you know, it's really, um, as we get to this final case study and we get to the, the master class, if you will, you know, in large, this is a group that's that's at top of their sourcing and procurement game. You know, they're they're in sort of best in class metrics in terms of their performance. They've likely deployed an integrated approach to, to source to pay to streamline their processes enterprise wide. But but when you get to that stage, they're inevitably asking what's next. And really deploying these 4.0 kind of procurement technologies to get to that next level of performance is one of the most viable uh, strategies for folks at, at this master stage. In fact, we kind of look at where they are today and say they are likely then to pursue one or more of the following strategies to get to that next level. So part of it is about pushing the envelope on, on adopting the, the 4.0 new or emerging technologies. But the other part also is, is um, you know, re elevating the status of procurement and using technology to help them do that to first and foremost align procurement with finance. So for many organizations, even when they're, say, the master class at the top of their game, best in class, they may not yet be on the same page with finance. And, and uh, beyond just finance or the CFO, really gaining trusted advisor status with the C-suite, which would be clearly a way to, to elevate the, the status and stature of procurement. So at this stage, we're probably pursuing a combination of these strategies, and I'll just take you through a final case study here, a telecommunications provider whose business objective it was to align procurement and, and establish credibility with the C-suite by focusing on an enterprise-wide savings tracking platform and methodology. So what were the gaps that they recognized? Well, first of all, uh, if we get to the tools, uh, insistent method. So not having a consent agreed upon spend baseline and, and ineffective methods for calculating spend. So previously, for example, they looked at spend being PO commitments. Some was that actually overstated actual spend in some cases, because not all POs actually turn into, uh, you know, an actual invoice coming back. And in other cases, understated spend by excluding all those non-PO categories that go on. So first it was to get agreement on, we need a new method, new definition of spend. Spend was, in fact, a paid invoice for both non-PO or PO categories. Anything all spend on the table, so whether it's coming through on a P card, expense report, or other methods. But from a tool standpoint, when it came to tracking and reporting savings, the challenges uh, this telco provider faced were to a lot of organizations trying to do this through combination of an Excel and email means they did have 
approved processes, version controls, an agreed upon spend baseline, and a consistent calculation and allocation methodology. And because of limitations, little ability to collaborate across business units and geographies to make sure you're getting global spend coverage. And in the bottom line, here was finance did not even acknowledge procurement claim savings because there was no standardized method for calculating and tracking the savings that procurement produced. So in deploying an enterprise-wide capability for financial savings management and tracking, they started at the top. The CFO sponsoring the project was key. Getting those finance professionals, financial analysts specifically involved up front to find the methodology was also key to success here. So what is going to be our accounting treatment for capital expenditure versus operating expenditure versus perhaps cost of goods sold? And how are we going to define cost reduction versus cost avoidance? So what they rolled out was this global platform that could provide a single version of the truth, a full audit trail, version control, make sure you have secure access across the enterprise, Bring in those global users, so that means having for change conversion, a uh, lingual user interfaces, being able to accommodate all the different types of savings projects and definitions, and here at the end that you've got uh, accountability, so sent off by budget owners and ants and full dashboard analytics. So that form in a relatively short period of time within the first year is can be viewed by the CFO as the tool that saves me money, which means increasing the volume of savings projects, over 600 savings projects, increasing the savings rate, so 40 to $50 million in incremental savings, and bringing all the stakeholders involved into a common platform and lexicon. So hundreds of users across the organization and uh, driving dramatic productivity. So category managers actually figured they, they got back two hours of every day, so 25% productivity gain if they're not having to gather data to report on the things they're contributing from the, the categories that they're managing. And at the end of the day, it also meant ending this capability beyond traditional procurement, so savings tracking for non-procurement products like reorganizations or ERP consolidation or M&A, and applying to other processes. SOP, cash flow, et cetera. So that's how you get to the, the next level of purpose. And let me turn it uh, back to you, Andrew, for some closing thoughts. Right. Strategies for success or recommendations, right? So, you know, against the backdrop of rapidly evolving supply chains and, and so customer bases, how organizations communicate, collaborate, transact with their trading partners, and the enabling technologies and platforms that they utilize will take on increasing importance to procurement operations and to business success, right? But to start, right, the CEO and the procurement leadership teams simply have to make technology adoption a priority over other considerations. If they fail to do so, they're signaling to the entire organization that poor or mediocre user adoption is acceptable. So here's some recommendations based upon the, the three tiers of maturity as modeled in this presentation by Richard, right? So the apprentice, and, and, and I think here, right, it's start with and focus on the basics and getting them right, right? Um, you know, more than anything else, right, you have to be able to, you, you know, walk before you can run. Um, you know, you have to learn how to drive the car before you start taking a, a Porsche from zero to 60 very fast. Um, you know, collaborate with the partners and the expertise within the organization like IT uh, and leverage the strengths of that organization. You know, build consensus. Um, so as I said before, when we were looking at the apprentice uh, business case that Richard, uh, you know, walked us through, right, the ROIs are there, right? What needed is, you know, sort of the backbone and, and the focus um, to to get it done, you know, essentially. Now, right, so this is where you've got some technologies in place um, and starting to make it part of the, you know, standard business operating. Now you look to sort of your involvement. 
what are the next levels of capabilities, right? So Matt walked us through, you know, some 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 very exciting capabilities that uh, you know have emerged, right? So you know, the future really is now. Technologies today, um, you know, are going to you know enable a different type of analysis. You know, from a, a big data management standpoint, we're already seeing procurement organizations uh, taking their operational data and becoming smarter in how they execute their projects based upon. Um, an analysis that would not have been able, you know, that you're not able to perform, you know, within Excel alone. Um, so it's really starting to build here the path to the next generation forward. And it really is, as Matt said, an exciting time to work in procurement because these technologies really do have, these newer technologies have the opportunity to be truly transformative and to get procurement to the next level. Um, so, you know, for Nestor's, right, so, so for all organizations, really, you should be looking at the Industry 4.0 technologies, um, you know, not because you're going to start to use them today, uh, but because you're beginning to, you know, start to understand how they emerge and what the opportunities are. Now, for, you know, those that are the masters, the most advanced and mature, we, we would call them the best in class as well, um, you know, now is really the opportunity to investigate more significantly these technologies that have been proven uh, of great value elsewhere within uh, the business landscape, maybe even elsewhere within your own companies. Uh, but, but now's the time to, to begin to look at, um, you know, f from a real term and from a near term standpoint, you know, where are uh, the use cases for some of these capabilities? Again, it's a very exciting time. Um, you know, you've got to get a walk before you uh, can run and um, you have to walk before you can drive too. So, um, you know, with that, uh, I think we'd like to open up if we've got time for a question or two. Yeah, certainly we don't, Andrew, but then, and and Matt, but we we wanted to make sure we got through all the content. We will be able to follow up afterwards for for the questions that we've received. But uh, unfortunately, we're we're short of time today. But we wanted to make sure we covered you know highlights from this report, and and I think hopefully wet the appetite of the tier to download the full report. So uh, you're going to get, as I mentioned uh, outset, uh, an email within 24 hours from, from the webinar that will include uh, the slide deck presentation. You'll have access to that and, and the ability to download the report along with your continuing education for the, for the session as well today. So finally, here's the contact information to reach out uh, to any of us. For, for uh, more information or dialogue, we'll follow up on your questions. And thanks so much, Matt, for a great presentation. Thanks, everyone, for attending today.